Good morning. If you open up your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. really good to be here this morning. I uh, was put to the test last night in terms of practicing what you preach. I recently finished preaching 2 Peter chapter 3 and two of the saints in Clarissa and then I also taught the latter end of 2 Timothy or uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 to the college age kids and it was all about the fact that it's going to be a new heavens and a new earth and that everything before that is going to dissolve and melt and the and so you you uh, teach that why would you want to hold on to anything on earth here because everything's going to what? Burn. Everything's going to burn and so my son's car, my car, <laughs> it's actually my car, went up in flames last night so. I thought I was all ready to go. Yeah. And then my other son told me Dad, you want to make sure you blow it before the message. <laughs> you try not to blow it during the message. <laughs> so let's have a word of prayer before we uh, look into this, uh, this text that, um, by the grace of God, I can communicate a level of depth that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his father and so it's just a very deep precious uh, section of scripture here. Father thank you for giving me the spirit, the Holy Spirit to make your word become real in my thinking and Father these truths that we are about to study are not natural, they're supernatural. A wonderful wonderful prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ to you, Father. Trust that we would even, in our hearts at this time right now, have a wonderful fellowship with you, Father, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, trust that I could communicate to the folks at this time, Father, a level of depth that you've impressed me with regarding this prayer of your Son to you. And all the saints could say, Amen. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. My father, my earthly father, would once in a while tell me, Peter, it all starts on paper. And that was in reference to a certain plan that was going to be carried out. See, my father worked as a right-of-way engineer for the Minnesota Power Company. And a right-of-way engineer determines where the transmission lines are going to go from point A eventually to the finishing point. And once in a while I'd ask my dad, you know, what are you working on back at the office? And he used to look off up into the, this direction here and he'd kind of squint his eyes. And uh, he would be able to describe for me his recent project that was on paper. And he would bring all this plans into the forefront of his thinking as he was squinting off and looking up in this direction and he'd weigh it all out in his mind and then it became real in his thinking enough to be able to communicate it to me. Peter, here's what we're working on. A power line through this part of northern Minnesota. And do you think as my father was imaging this in his mind that it had some reality to it that eventually it was going to come to completion? And I trust that you would say amen to that, right? So as he's thinking about the plans on paper, in his mind, eventually that whole plan is going to be able to be of some substance. It's going to be the real thing. And he knows that, that if the plans are all carried out, is going to be a reality and that power line will eventually get built and bring electricity to the folks wherever. And this is our understanding of our opening verse in John chapter 17 where Jesus Christ said this, Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. And what is he doing? He's 
taking and bringing his father's instructions to the forefront of his thinking. He's taking his father's instructions, the ones on paper, if you will. He's meditating on it, depending on it, weighing it all out in his mind. And they're so vivid in his mind, so real in his mind before his father that he said, Father, the hour has come. Some comments regarding this particular statement. Father, the hour has come. It is the most remarkable prayer following the most full and consoling discourse ever uttered on earth. This is truly beyond measure, a warm and hearty prayer. He opens the depths of his heart, both in reference to us and to his Father, and he pours them all out. It sounds so honest, so simple. It is so deep, so rich, so wide, no one can fathom it. This is a great portion of Scripture. I feel wholly and totally inadequate to deal with this prayer. J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon McGee goes on to ask, what hour? Father, the hour has come. What hour is this? J. Vernon McGee goes on to say, well, the hour that had been set back yonder in eternity. As he speaks, the clock is striking the hour that was set way back in eternity because he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. J. Vernon McGee goes on to say, It was arranged back there now. It was arranged back there. Now the hour has come. See, the plans on paper that were put there in eternity past by the Father, Jesus is so gripped by his Father's instructions, so gripped by his Father's will right now, that the reality of that plan on paper is coming to fruition in his mind. Father, the hour has come. Now when he addresses this hour to come in John 17, 1 through 19, he's going to address four things in the hour to come. Four things in the hour to come. The first thing that he is going to address in verse 1 through 5, with a key word found in verses 1 through 5, is this word glorify, found twice or a form of this word. Found again once in verse 4 and twice in verse 5. I could also make an argument, although wouldn't put a lot of weight on it, that if you look at verse 5 and he says, and now, which is presenting what he wants to first talk to the Father about. And then the second thing that he wants to talk to the Father about, verses 6 through 10, has to do with this word given or gave, twice found in verse 6, once in verse 7, twice in verse 8, and once in verse 9. The third thing that Jesus Christ wants to talk or speak to his Father about, found in verses 11 through 12, our key word there is the word keep or kept. Jesus Christ is going to talk to his Father and say, the hour has come, and I want to talk to you about this word, keep or kept. could also make another case for the word now in verse 11. Also in verses 6 through 10, the word now is there, introducing a new thought, but also in parallel with the rest of the section. And then finally in verses 13 through 19, Father, the hour has come. I want to talk to you about my thoughts about sanctifying them. So we look at our text, and our title of our message is right from our text, Father, the hour has come. What is Christ visualizing in his mind? What is, he, what is so real and so vivid in his mind at this point when he says, Father, the hour has come? He's understanding that mankind lives in this world and mankind is a sinner. He's understanding that because God is holy, there's a barrier between God and man, the sin barrier. 
Jesus Christ is understanding that he's going to demonstrate his love, his unconditional love towards the world when he says, Father, the hour has come. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to take upon myself the sins of the world. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to ascend to your right hand, Father. And so when he said, Father, the hour has come, He is then understanding as well that there is going to be a number of people that believe on him. And so this is what is a foregone conclusion in his mind when he thinks about the hour has come. So once again, if we're going to break down our text into the four sections, Father, the hour has come. I want you ultimately to be glorified through me. He will make clear. And when he says, Father, I want you to be glorified, what he's talking about is this realm right here. I want you to be glorified when it comes to my going to the cross very shortly. Hours to come. In hours to come. I want you to get the glory when I go to the cross. I want you to get the glory when I am buried and rise again and am ascended at your right hand. Ultimately, Father, I want you to receive the glory. And then, Father, I want to talk to you about the disciples, those you have given to me. And then, Father, I want to talk to you about how you keep them. And then, Father, finally, I want to talk to you about how you sanctify them. And this is talking about those that believe in him, namely his disciples in the context of John 17. So if we're going to try to look at this whole John 17, we would say it encompasses this hour to come. Christ and him going to the cross and rising and resurrecting and resurrecting and ascending to his right hand and how that relates to those disciples that have believed on him. So let's look at our first section out of the four. Father... I want you to be glorified. Again, our key word in verses 1 through 5 is glorify or glorified or glory. He starts out in verse 1 is his prayer to his father. Glorify your son. Father, I just want you to elevate me at this time. I want you to strengthen me. I want you to lift me up. Father, I want you to give me the victory In the hour to come, make it a worthwhile occasion. I want my death. I want my burial. I want my resurrection. I want my ascension. The hour to be the most precious hour mankind has ever known. Ultimately, so that you can be glorified, Father. That your Son also may glorify you. Jesus starts out his prayer by expressing his desire to glorify the Father. His entire ministry on planet Earth revolved around one single purpose. I want to reveal my Father to mankind. Father, I want you to give me the victory so I can give you the glory. Father, I want your wisdom. I want your power. I want your love to be made known through me so that you get the glory. This is my prayer. At the end of this prayer, he says, in conclusion, O righteous Father, and I have declared to them your name. Christ goes on to say, speaking to his Father, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Father, you've given me the power, the right, to have authority over all creation. See, Christ could do whatever he wanted to with mankind. He could snuff us out at any time he wanted to. He could crush us any time he wanted. The last time we sinned, he could scorch us with a lightning bolt. But in his loving grace, he takes that authority, that power, that right to give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And that same power 
That same authority is given to you and me to go into all the world. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That he should give eternal life to as many as have, you have given him. Well, what is eternal life? Verse 3 goes on to say, and this is eternal life. It's pretty simple, isn't it? This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ. See, something that's eternal is everlasting. It's perpetual. It is endless. Never ending. Jesus said, I am the life. Period. If you want to know what life's all about, here's your answer right here. And this is eternal. Not only eternal, but this is life. This is eternal life. Some people think, wow, this is really living. And they live on planet Earth apart from a supernatural understanding of Christ being life. People think pursuits in business and success, wealth, good relationships, sex, entertainment, and doing good to others is really living. See, real living is found right here in this verse. This is eternal life, that you possess initially eternal life through Christ. And then you experience that life when you begin to abide in Christ and His words abide in you. See, the understanding is more than simply existing forever, although that is simply awesome. But a relational knowledge of Jesus Christ, which we have certainly seen since our opening message in John 13. The word eternal life is found 32, in 32 verses in the New Testament. Fifteen of those are in John and 1 John. No wonder why 1 John 5.20 has a parallel thought. That we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. This is the true God. This is eternal life. And how would you, how would you describe eternal life in one person? The lovely man, Jesus Christ. This is why the word abide found 30, in 34 verses in the New Testament. Most of those are found in 1 John, John, and 2 John. To abide in Him would be to say, and now I know what living is all about, and His words abiding in me. Christ goes on to say, I have glorified you on the earth I have finished the work which you have given me to do. See, the plan on paper is it's still on paper, isn't it? But the, the reality of it coming in just a few hours is so real in Christ's mind at this point because he's taking by faith his Father's will. It's a foregone conclusion that he has gone to the cross in his mind at this point. Father, I, I promoted you on planet Earth. I always elevated your name on planet Earth. I had no hidden agenda. I was never any kind of chameleon Christian. Just always loved to do your Father's will. Or the, the will of you, Father. And he says, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Philippians 2.8 says he was obedient unto death, the death of the cross. It was so real, Christ's instructions from his Father, that this was a reality in his mind before it happened. It was a foregone conclusion. John 19.30 says it is finished. Christ took upon himself your sins and mine. All have been paid for, paid in full. See, the future is so real in his mind. He's taking by faith that this has substance to it in his mind. <clears throat> See, this is how we operate in our Christian life when it comes to future things that the Lord has promised. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, something that has substance to it has substance to it, right? And so that, that's got substance to it. And if you can take by faith something in the future that you know is going to be reality, it becomes your reality in the present. 
That's why I like this quote. Such reliance enables the believer to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. You know, we operate like this all the time. I was on the phone with Pastor Roxer last week. What do you think he was talking about? About this conference, right? Think he was excited about it last week? Were the plans all on what? Paper, Paper, right? Was it real in his mind the following week? Almost like it would have caused him to change his way of thinking on that day and needing to take care of some things because of that future substance was such a reality in his mind at that time, right? Amen? We do this all the time. In fact, I'm teaching the book of Jude. And I was having a tough time coming up with the illustration for dreamers. I think it's in Jude 6, 7, or 8. Pastor Dennis also told me last week that he was looking forward at that time and losing 10 pounds. (laughs) Dreamer. See, some things have substance on paper and some things don't. (laughs) But we do it all the time, don't we, folks? You want to put your faith in on paper on a bunch of dreams that you think are going to come to a reality? It's all going to burn. The only substance that you have that you know on paper will be a reality for you is the substance of eternal life found in who? Jesus Christ. So is he worth living for? Amen. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. What's Jesus Christ looking forward to at this point? His future resurrection and ascension at his Father's right hand. Our first section, Father, I want you to be one word we think through. I want I just Father, I just want you to be glorified. How does that apply to you and me? Well, let's water this seed of the upper room discourse and move on in our thinking, how that applies to you and me, in our understanding of being in the church age. You and I have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have been now placed with the Lord Jesus Christ and sit with Him in the heavenly places. He now wants you to simply take by faith in the fact that you are one with the Father through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we mean when we now water the seed of the upper room discourse and we see through the New Testament epistles, here's my reality, here's my life, here's here's what life's all about. I'm in Christ Jesus. So now I can pray, Father, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Father, I want you to be glorified whether I eat or drink or whatever I do. I can have the same mind of Christ. Father, I want you to get the glory. Father, I want to be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of you. Jesus Christ said, Father, I want you to be glorified. The believer takes this and says, Father, I want you to be glorified with a greater understanding of you in Christ Jesus and sharing in that code, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you simply take that by faith and the supernatural spirit of, the God, of God will make that real in your mind and you will be able to say, for me to live is and to die would be amen. Right? Jesus Christ spoke and he said, Father, the hour has come. You have given me them. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. I have made it so clear, Father. I have demonstrated you to them through me, he's saying. Your name has been declared on planet earth, Father, to the men you have given me out of the world. And these are specifically the eleven disciples.
as he is now speaking to this, about this group of men that God the Father has given to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, you, Jesus Christ could say, how could anyone miss it? It's so plain. And we know that Philip had a hard time catching on, didn't he? But that's good news for you and me, isn't it? Because these supernatural truths don't come overnight, do they? They come by diligently responding by faith to these truths so the Spirit of God can add another little divine viewpoint to your thinking. And when we struggle with things, we keep going before the Lord and say, you know what, Lord, I'm struggling with that. And there's some things maybe that will never really come to total grips in your thinking because, you know what, God's infinite and we're finite. But let's just keep on keeping on in these truths and allow the Lord to mature us until we go home to be with Him and row together for the cause of Christ. I have manifested your name to the men you have given me out of this world. These are the elect. And who are the elect? Those that have believed. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 teaches this as well. Who are those that are chosen, but those that have believed in the truth? You have given me these individuals literally out of this world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. The disciples overall have had a mentality of keep on keeping on. The idea of keep on keeping on and the fact that they have kept his word in terms of abiding in him, they've, as a pattern, been willing to remain steadfast, a willingness to hold on to. See, when you think of keep on keeping on, you're thinking of, I'm going to cling to something. I'm going to keep continually maintaining a clinging attitude. I'm going to be a disciple. And so he says, you have given me them. This is a positional truth. And Christ talks about how they have been willing to keep on keeping on. In their walk with him. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Father, they've been established. I've been with them. In my ministry for years, three years, I've taught and I've instructed them. Father, they believe in everything that you gave me on paper. I've shared this with the office staff. Here's what they're convinced of. They're convinced of that transmission line eventually going, coming to fruition. Father, your plan has been very successful. They're impressed with your plan. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. And again in verse 7, now could certainly be, now I want to talk to you about how you have given me them. Christ goes on to explain in verse 8, he says, For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. For says, here's further explanation. What does it mean about how I have given to them the words which you have given me? Father, they've, they've liked the plan on paper. They liked the divine viewpoint directive that I have given them. They like the whole new set of instructions that they're hearing. They've never heard that in this world before. I showed them, Father, your right-of-way plans. And they have received it. They have accepted it. Praise you, Father. They've learned it. They've picked up on everything or most things to a certain degree, according to the text here, that you have communicated through me to them. Because it says in the middle of verse 8, they have known surely that I came forth from you. They've got a conviction that I am from you, Father. Not the unsaved, but the saved, and particularly these 11 disciples. They believed. They're sure of it. 
They believed in the divine mission that I have for them through you, Father. They believed in the paper that I delivered to them. It's become a substance in their minds. It's become a reality. Father, your plan is successful. Father, I, I pray for them. So when he says, I pray for them, who is the them? Well, our text makes it clear. The ones that you have given me. The ones that you gave to me. The ones you have given me. The ones you have given me. <coughs> and who are those? The ones that believed. I pray for them. And what does he pray for? Well, if we're just going to take the text, I would assume he's going to pray that they would keep on keeping on. With what? Dreams? How about the words? The plan on paper that was delivered to them that now has reality, a substance to it. I pray that they would continue to have conviction regarding these truths and not get swayed pulled away by the philosophies and the religions of this world. That's what he prays for. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I'm not praying for the unsaved in this text. But in contrast, I'm praying for those you have given me, for they are yours. <laughs> And all are mine, are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So what does he say at the end of our section on, you have given me them? He says, all the disciples, and all mine, are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Is there any doubt that they have been given to the Father? Is there any doubt? What a picture of grace. <coughs> Jesus Christ spoke to the Father. He continues on. Or excuse me, how can we see this in our lives and watering the seed of you have given me them? For you and I as a believer in the church age, in this age of grace, you and I have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We still live in this world, but we have died with Christ. We are buried with Christ. We arose with Christ. We are sitting there with the Heavenly Father and we have been given to him. Now you take by faith that truth and allow the Spirit of God to make that just something so real in your mind. It's got substance to it. And you can pray, Father, I'm so thankful for the grace which was given to me by Jesus Christ. Father, I want to glorify you in the Lord Jesus Christ. You loved me and have given me everlasting comfort and good hope by grace. Father, many thanks. You saved me, called me with a holy calling, not according to my works, but according to your own purpose and grace, which was given me in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. This is in the true sense of given that we see in, in John 17 here. Before the foundation of the world, I can say, before time began, I was given to the Father by the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Because I, he knew that I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, many praises to you have given me eternal life, and this life is in your Son. Father, I've been given eternal life through the good shepherd who gave his life for me, and I will never perish. You are awesome, Lord. You're the greatest. 
Jesus Christ spoke to the Father. Father, I want you to be glorified. I want to talk to you about how you have given me them. Now, I want to talk to you about you keeping them. And this word now could be an introduction to our next section as well. Verse 11 and 12, our key word keep or kept. Verse 11, he says, Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. What a foregone conclusion in his mind again. Isn't this classic? I mean, he's so dependent on his father's real. It's so real in his mind that it's substance in his mind. It's, It's like, it's already happened. So he says, I'm no longer part of this world. It's a foregone conclusion he's going to the cross. Because he says, I'm no longer in the world. And the only way he can say that is if he knows that God's going to get the glory and he's going to be ascended at the right hand of God the Father. But there's still some folks in the world. But these are in the world. His disciples. Father, I've, I've come to you So what do these that are in the world need to know? Holy Father, keep, keep through your name those whom you have given to me that they may be one as we are. Father, keep these individuals, these disciples, that they may be one as we are one. Does it look like we're going to be kept by him? Are, we, are these individuals, these disciples, going to be preserved? These believers, are they going to be held by God the Father and God the Son? Amen. Is he going to abandon anyone? Is he going to leave them high and dry? Is he going to forsake anyone? No. Nope. Disciples might have thought, or did, to be convinced of these truths in this prayer, Christ's priestly prayer to his Father. They don't have to say, don't forsake us, don't abandon us, don't desert us. And they can understand that God the Father and God the Son will keep them, preserve them. Verse 12 says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. What time do we have to? I don't know. I I just didn't ever look at the clock. What time did we start? 10 o'clock? Twenty to eleven. Okay. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. So here's Christ with his disciples, and where are they? They're in the world. He says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them. And I kept them in your name. He says, those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost. Nobody, not a soul, not a single person that the Father gave to Jesus Christ have been lost. Father, you keep them, and I know you will. Father, Tom Siegel calls them a bunch of Muhammad Ali's, but I've not lost any of them. Father Sean Lachlan calls them a bunch of dirty rats. He says, but I haven't, I haven't lost any of them. I haven't misplaced, I haven't misplaced one. 
I'm not like, Father, I'm not, where's so-and-so? I haven't heard from him in a long time. I have not lost one. I haven't lost the unfaithful ones, the double-minded ones, the really wicked ones. And I know he's just speaking of his disciples here, but on a broad scale of all those who believed in him. He never said I had a hard time keeping any of them. Although maybe he was tempted to go into, like, aluminum siding at times. <laughs> There's nobody out there in the world that is lost that has placed their faith in me. Father, you keep them. Accept the son of perdition. It's important to understand the word accept only goes back to this phrase, is lost. It doesn't go back to those that he promises to keep. One is lost, the son of perdition. You know, uh, it had to be grieving for the Lord Jesus Christ to pray this to his Father. There is one, that, there is one individual that's lost. My, uh, a friend. We know he's lost from other scripture. John 6, 64 says there's some that would not believe that would betray him. John 13 says, who is that that betrayed him? Judas Iscariot. We know from John 13, 11, that the one who betrayed him was not clean, and not being clean is synonymous with being lost. Interesting, when he said, except the son of perdition, the son of destruction, the one that would be judged to eternity apart from the life of Christ, even though emotionally I'm sure it was hard for him to pray this to his father, I would assume. But still God's character was not violated in his prayer. Even though you're a good friend or a friend, I will not violate the character of God. And he could say the son of perdition. That the scripture might be fulfilled John 13, 18, the scripture may be fulfilled, which is a reference to Psalm 41, 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So let's water this truth from moving on from the disciples taking heed to this prayer. Let's water this seed truth and take it into the New Testament church age for you and I as believers. Once again, you've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You still live on planet <laughs> Earth, but the reality is that you are now died with Christ, you're buried with Christ, and you sit at His right hand. The reality is that you're kept by the Lord. You're secure in Christ. You take that by faith, and now you can respond in prayer with that secure understanding. Father, I know whom I believed and am persuaded that you are able to keep what I've entrusted to you until that day I'm odd and you are awesome. <coughs> Father, I am elect. I'm set apart by the Spirit. I've been saved by the blood of Jesus. I have a living hope for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that will not fade away. Father, I am kept by your power through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is awesome. Even though you know for a little while I'm going through some tough times, Father, I love to love your Son. Because I'm kept in him. 
Jesus Christ spoke to the Father and said, Father, sanctify them. Verses 13 through 19, and also the word now could bring us into our final point. In verse 13, now. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. When he says here, but now I come to you, Father, and these things I speak in the world, he's not talking to the unsaved because the word that makes it clear that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. See, Jesus did proclaim to the world. He did speak to the world. Here's some things that he said to the world. And if I'm not wrong, I think I got all these observations from John chapter 1 through 12. The Father sent me into the world. This is what he spoke to the world. He did owed her, he would have did owed. I came to take away the sin of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. Isn't that amazing? One man comes on planet Earth and says, I am the light of the world. Wow. Who are we? God loves the world. I came to save the world. I give life to the world. The world would believe that my Father sent me. That's what he spoke to the world, the unsaved. But here's what he spoke in verse 13 to his disciples. What Jesus proclaimed to his own in the world. And this is the whole part of willingness to be practically sanctified before the Lord, taking these truths and allow them to be dwelling in your thinking. What Jesus Christ proclaimed to his own in the world, I love my own in the world to the end. I will keep you. Father, I will keep them through your name. Or you keep them through your name. I chose you out of the world. The world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. He spoke this. He says, I will leave the world, but you will see me someday. See, these are wor words that give you victory over the world, don't they? These are w words that will give you victory while you're in the world. <laughs> these have substance to them. Because you know the blueprint that was in eternity past was carried out when Jesus Christ said, The Father, the hour has come. And we look back and say, The Father, I know the hour did come. And now I can take these truths to dwell on, to allow them to be a reality in my mind so that I can have victory over this world. He says, um, but now I come to you in these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. <coughs> What was Jesus Christ saying here? The joy of anticipation when he should see the eternal results of his suffering. Did Christ understand now faith is the substance of things hoped for? Knowing he's going to go home to be with his father after he went through the suffering? I can see the results, the eternal results of the suffering, and that gives me joy? Amen. Amen.
great joy in going to the cross and in the end saying, I'm going to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Great joy in knowing that the whole process of being obedient to the death of the death of the cross, knowing that I will be exalted at his right hand. Father, I just want my joy that I'm enjoying right now in my prayer before you to be in them as well. I think C.I. Schofield captured it pretty well when he said this. I think that Pilate, who kept his burning boat against the shore until every passenger was safe, though his own hands burnt to a crisp as he held the wheel, must have had a joy greater than the pain. This is a very high kind of joy, but we may realize it after all, may we not? Schofield has a similar illustration, and he says, I think that captain who stood upon the deck of the sinking ship and gave his place in the last boat to a poor stowaway who had no kind of claim upon him and saw him pass on into safety while he went down with the ship, drank deeply of this vicarious suffering. See, the joy that he wants the disciples to have. You're going to have some tribulation in this world. Cheer up. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. What an amazing statement. Father, I'm speaking to you now. I have given them your word. I have given to them the words which you have given me. And the unsaved world hates it. Because the unsaved world is not part of our world, Father. <coughs> Just as I am not of the world. Father, the unsaved world that I'm a part of at this time. They hate them. Why? Why do they hate us so? We're not of this world, Father. This world is self-righteous in their ways. Those who have believed on me have understood they need our righteousness, Father. Regarding this world and hating the disciples and you and me, at first one would think that a religion which exalts and seeks to follow the only perfect and righteous man who has ever lived on this earth, who never harmed anyone, whose words delivered from superstition and fear, whose works redeemed from pain and demons and death and hunger, whose life was as a great shaft of light shot into the murky darkness of the Roman world in that sensual and skeptic century who died because he loved us and who always sought to bring men into communion with God to bestow upon them eternal life and a home in heaven, one would have thought, that such a character and the religion which his life and work on earth established would have been welcomed with open arms the first moment it was announced and would, by its very message, the good works which flowed from it and the hope which it established never know opposition or attack or denunciation except from the demons of hell and Satan who is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. But such has not been its history. In fact, the New Testament itself, from the records of the birth of our Lord down to the end of St. John's vision of the era of anarchy and persecution to come, testifies in the most startling way the fact that Christ himself was most viciously and constantly hated, that his apostles suffered the same opposition, and that it was predicted by these very apostles that Christianity would continue to suffer down to the end of this age. Wilbur M. Smith. 
I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. We've seen at this point, Father, the Lord Jesus Christ prays to the Father and says, You have given me them. You keep them. See, what more could God the Father offer to us? We've been given to Him. We've, our names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. You think He cares for us of eternity past? He knows that you were given to Him. And then it says, You keep them. Our names will continually be having life in the book of life throughout the rest of eternity, we're preserved in Christ Jesus, Jude 1. What more could he offer? Eternal life in eternity past to eternity future. Now he says, I want them to be delivered practically from this world system. So that's why he says that you should keep them from the evil one is a prayer now for their sanctification. the evil one, the God of this world. Keep them from this Satanocracy. Keep them from this, I read an author calling this world system, the Nagosphere. All the annoyances, all the harasses, all the bothers of them things. Of course, none of you could relate to what Nagosphere would mean. So... Keep them from it, which is now basically saying, when he says keep them from, sanctify them, which is our last prayer that our Savior is praying to his Father. Father, they've been, they've been given, they've been kept. What more could they want? Now I've given them your word, which now they can be practically set apart from you while they are still in this world system. <coughs> They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He's left us his truth to be practically set apart unto him. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. In fact, if I was just going to take two words that would practically set me apart unto the Heavenly Father is the two words given and kept. Let's start there. I can now enjoy that I am given and kept, which lifts me right out of this world system. Your word is truth. I'm delivered from all the philosophies and lies of this world. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Father, you sent me into this world. So send I them. Now I send my disciples into the world. I'm not going to take them out of the world yet. I've got a great commission for them. Go out into all the world under my authority. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. And for their sakes, for our sakes, for you and me, I sanctify myself. How does Jesus Christ sanctify himself? Through the word, so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Does it look like we've got enough truths, as Brett said, enough truths to pertain to life and godliness? I've been given in eternity past. I'm kept in, through eternity future. And I've got the word of God and the spirit of God to be able to give me victory from the lies of this world system. Be of good cheer. How is Christ sanctified? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How are you and I practically sanctified? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Sanctify them. 
let's put water on this seed and bring it to the church age for you and me. You and I have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The power of the resurrection lifts up into the heavenlies and we're seated at the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been given and we've been kept and the Lord wants us to practically enjoy this life here in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. I can walk by faith in this and the Spirit of God causes me to say, wow, amen. Father, you're awesome. And I can say, Father, I want to allow you as the God of peace to sanctify me in every area of my life through the truth of your word. What have we seen here this morning? How his disciples, how God the Father was glorified in Christ's opening part of his prayer. And then he prayed for his disciples. Talked about how you have given me them, you keep them, and you sanctify them. So we water that. In this church age, we have the Holy Spirit. We died with Christ, we're buried, we're resurrected with Him. And so we can duplicate the Lord's Prayer by His grace as we walk by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us. And we can say, Father, the hour did come. And through your Son, I want to do four things. I want to talk to you about four things. Through your Son, I glorify you. Through your Son, I've been given to you in eternity past. Through your Son, I am kept eternity future by you. And Father, through your Son, I'm sanctified by you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text of Scripture. Trust that it could be made more of our divine viewpoint, Father. I've just been humbled by it and very encouraged by it as well. And I trust that our minds would be allowing the Spirit of God to take a hold of these things as we walk by faith and just say, Lord, I just want to give you the glory of my life. What more could you offer to us, Father, than you've given us eternal life and that we're kept, preserved in Christ Jesus for eternity future? Is it worth it to be practically set apart before you by faith as you want us to just give you the honor and glory? In Christ's name we pray.